Hello, all right, so today we are talking about agency, justice, and mercy from the talk Free Forever to Act for Themselves in October 2014 by Elder Christofferson as well as Alma chapter 42 and 2 Nephi chapter 2 and a tidbit of other stuff that I'll pull from. So by the way, um, when I provide extra article or extra video or suggest extra reading, you know, like of course that's all just optional. So however much you want to get into it, if there's a particular topic that you feel called to study out further, or if you're feeling like it's applying to you more so and you need to learn more, then those are just other things I wanted to include as I think of them. If something comes to me and I want to share that. So that you definitely shouldn't be feeling pressure. Um, and if three classes a week is a lot for you, then this Facebook group will stay up for a while and just watch what videos you feel called to watch. So really just however you can use this, what I'm putting out there, however you can make it relevant to your life and let it be a blessing to you without putting a lot of pressure on you. You're just welcome to do that and I'm excited to have you participate however much you want to. And after I get through with this first slew of articles that I have been loving lately, we'll probably slow down to twice a week. <laughs> but right now, I'm so excited to get through these articles. And then I'll take a look at the in, at the actual institute manual, but that even that's based on conference talks. In fact, that's kind of where I got the idea because a couple years ago, it was in 2017, I did a Facebook group all about the New Testament and I was just studying it on my own and then I would post a couple highlights or thoughts from my study and it was just supposed to be like an inspirational message because people, it wasn't really interactive. But it was cool because it was accountability for me and then I was just putting a thought out there for anybody who wanted to look further into that particular concept or chapter. But what I found is in the Institute Manual, every, it would, it would have a certain, a, a passage of verses, a principle from the doctrine, and they would give you a quote and a link to go read this quote from a conference talk. And some of them were back in the 70s or the 80s, and I just felt like I was getting like the best of the best conference talks, and I collected a lot of really awesome talks, and now I'm, I'm in the habit of printing them, I'm trying to get them organized because I want to have my binder full of highlighted marked up talks and the way that it's inspired me. So that's what I'm passionate about right now. So that's why I'm excited to share it with you. So I'm kind of doing the reverse and this is my personal study is taking a conference talk and then finding a passage of scripture that can apply to it so that we can be immersed in the scriptures and keeping up with the words of the living prophets. So that's my vision. Okay, so let's go to Alma 42. In verse 1, it says, Do ye try to suppose that it is injustice that a sinner should be consigned to a state of misery? So in my notes, I wrote, Are we a victim to God's will? Or are we creating our own reality? And this topic came up because I had the question, and in this October 2014, I had written down some questions to bring to conference and one of them, because I'd been hearing, uh, you know, different philosophies of different things. And we always say, you know, if it's God's will or the Lord is directing my life and orchestrating my life, like the, like the Lord's running the show. But then I was a little confused. And so I was praying and asking, does God run my life or do I run my life? Like who's in charge here? Like who's calling the shots? And Elder Christopherson gave this talk and my jaw dropped because here he says in the talk, well, I'm not supposed to get to the talk yet, but he says, who bears responsibility for what happens in our lives? And then he goes on to discuss that. So we are talking about who bears responsibility for what happens in our lives. Um, <clears throat> so does God love differently? If some people are redeemed to heaven and others are not, then some people who are not religious or they don't understand Christianity, they'll say, well, that's not fair. Why does he save some people and not other people, you know? Or even in our lives and now, why are some people blessed and some people aren't? Well, that's not fair. So they want, they want to prescribe to this notion that we have a God who just loves everybody the same and just wants to dole out all these blessings and everybody gets to go to heaven and it's just a beautiful, happy place. And that, that theory is 100% mercy. What they're doing there is they're denying justice. 
the law of justice is basically the law of agency. It's if, if we got ourselves into a situation, we have to get ourselves out of it, and we get to choose what blessings we want in our life. So if Heavenly Father just automatically doled out blessings, then where would the agency be? So that's what we're going to cover here. So we reap what we sow. So I was thinking if you're actually sowing seeds and you're having a garden. So if two people leased a garden space from this property manager, and let's say I sow watermelon seeds, and my friend sows tomatillos, because maybe the seeds for tomatillos look cool. <laughs> and then when I get a, a fresh, juicy, sweet watermelon, and they look at me and they go, well, that's not fair. Why do you get watermelon and I get these tomatillos? What am I supposed to do with these? <laughs> these aren't sweet. These aren't juicy. They're really, they're really pointless. Maggie, don't argue with me. Tomatillos are pointless. <laughs> so can the person say, no fair, you know, because, no, because they pick their seed and they reap that seed, you know, or can they say, well, I guess a property manager doesn't love me. They love me less. You know, does Heavenly Father love certain people less if they're not receiving blessings in their life? Well, if there are ways that they are blocking the blessings from coming into their lives because they're not following given laws, then that's on them. That's their choice. Okay, so that's what the talk is about. Now I'll go to the talk. On the second page, when I talk about pages, it's about the print up. When things turn bad, there's a tendency to blame others or even God. You know, like um, if we have a health situation, we'll say, well, this is what God wanted me to experience in my life. Like God gave me this health situation or a financial situation or a family or relationship situation. Like so many things that we just say, okay, I guess this is what God want, needs me to learn. And I'm not saying that's false. Uh, maybe we'll get further into that. I think that's gonna, that would be more of a discussion. But what he's saying is that we, we blame God. I'm of the notion that we can, we can always find somehow, somewhere where we are responsible. And even if we can't pinpoint how we're responsible for getting ourselves in that position, we can pinpoint how we're responsible for getting ourselves out of that situation. But wait, wait with me. <laughs> so what I've discovered through reading this talk is, well, it says here, it is his plan and his will that we have the principal decision-making role in our life's drama. God will not live our lives for us, nor control us, us as if we were his puppets. God will not act to make us something we do not choose by our actions to become. So we are using our actions, which includes our thoughts, to demonstrate our desires, because that's our agency. And as we use that, we then, part of our agency is we can choose to allow God to come into our lives and give us an extra boost and help us out and give us the blessings. Or some people live their lives and they're saying, I'm fine, God, I don't need you. I'm just going to do this on my own. Either way, we're directing our lives, right? So if I'm in charge of a big project, I can, I can invite someone, someone more powerful than me, to come and contribute their gifts and come help me out. You know, and so it's kind of like a delegation since I was in charge. Or it sounds weird to delegate to God, so maybe a submission to say, like, I'm in charge, but, but I'm actually going to let you call the shots on this, on this particular issue. So we can submit to God and let him bless our lives and orchestrate our lives because it came from our will, you know. The allowing him to do that was a choice that we made. So the power was still in our hands. We were calling all the shots. The cards for our life are in our hands. So this is why we are saved by grace after all we can do. I mean, if, if we were just saved by grace, period, then where would be the agency in that? We need to use our choice and put forth our efforts to demonstrate that this is what we want using our own free will. And that's a law of justice. So the law of justice says that if this is my life, God can't just intervene without my permission, you know, if we want that intervening influence, which would, which would be called mercy, it needs to satisfy the law of justice. So what he says here, this is on the next page. <clears throat> the process of repentance 
Acting to repent is a self-willed change. By making repentance a condition for receiving the gift of grace, God enables us to retain responsibility for ourselves. That's on the bottom of page three, if you have it printed up. So yes, yeah, so we are submitting or delegating our will to him to invite that mercy into our lives. And on, on the margin there, I wrote Alma 12, 34. Let's go look that up real quick. Therefore, whosoever repenteth and hardeneth not his heart, he shall have claim on mercy through mine only begotten Son unto a remission of his sins. And these shall enter into my rest. So I like the word claim on mercy. We didn't earn mercy. We didn't earn anything. We, we had to choose it. We had to claim it using our power. It all stems from our willpower. So Elder Christofferin says that when, condition, when repentance is a condition of receiving that, then we retain that responsibility because we were able to choose if we repent, when we repent, how we repent, da, da, da. And to what degree we repent and that, that, that allows a little bit more divine assistance in our lives. So the scriptures I like on this one, let's go. Second Nephi 2.27 This is a scripture mastery if you went to seminary. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh, and all things are given them which are expedient unto man, and they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and the power of the devil. So if you end up with captivity and death, you have no one else to blame but yourself because we are all given the power and the opportunity to make that choice. And so... What I believe is that we're not just talking about the afterlife. We're talking about the conditions of this life. It has stemmed as a result of our choices. And sometimes those are subconscious choices that we need to identify and find. Mosiah 2.41, which is hanging on my wall. Consider the blessed and the happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. Okay, so if you want to be happy, you keep the commandments of God. And you will receive that blessing of happiness. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual so the point is, and now let's go to this other quote by President Nelson. If you really want a certain blessing, find out what the laws are that govern that blessing and then work at becoming obedient to those laws. So if this is something I want in life, um, can I hope that it happens by chance? Or can I say, well, if it's God's will, it'll just happen. You know, people say when they serve missions to South America, a lot of them say like, Okay, like if it if it will if it's God's will, it'll it'll be it'll just happen, and that's really passive. So God does have a will for us, but we need to ask for it and seek it. And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes there's barriers to overcome, you know. So for example, it was God's will for the Jaredites to cross the sea, but they still had to problem solve and say, um, okay, how do we get a boat that will not let in any water, but will somehow let in light? And God didn't give them all the answers, and they still had to problem solve. So if you really want a certain blessing, let's say I want more financial success. I can pray for it, and I can pray for it, and say, well, I guess Heavenly Father doesn't want to bless me with that. Or I, I can look into what, what are the laws that can help, that help me bring this about, out of my willpower, out of my agency and my choice, and then work out of being obedient to those laws. So there are also laws for health. If we do the research and we try to apply laws for health, then we can bring about health in our life because we hold the cards for our life and we hold that power. And we can invite God to come in and bless us to have that. And if, uh, it, I mean, it's not gonna happen all by itself. So one example of that, by the way, is um, I was struggling a few months ago and I was even talking to my bishop and saying, I swear this was the Lord's idea. I felt prompted to do this, but it's not working out and I feel so frustrated. But if this was a prompting, why isn't he telling me how to do it? And my bishop said, well, you're not gonna wake up one morning with a letter of instructions on your pillow. Like, you've still gotta put in some effort and sweat and, and fight for this and figure it out. And so that has stayed with me because that meant so much to me that seeking God's will and inviting his hand into our lives does not negate our need for personal effort. So I posted an extra talk. It's below the post with um, 
Elder Christopherson's talk at that link. It's a story from LDS Living, and it talks about why, why sometimes it makes it hard for God to bless us. And um, just go ahead and take a look at that, but it's the same sort of idea that if we are using our agency to make certain choices that put up a wall, then he can't bless us because we hold the cards for our own lives. We are in charge of our lives. He cannot override that. We have to invite him to enter our lives and we have to do it on a given route, which is called the law. <laughs> like the, this is a law, these are the rules. If you want this blessing, if you want God to be a part of your life, or if you want mercy in your life, if you want salvation in the next life, these are the rules that you need to follow. It's up to you. You can choose. You can choose to follow those things. Okay. So back to Alma 42. Verse 12. Man, so there was no means to reclaim men from this fallen state, which man had brought upon himself because of his own disobedience. Therefore, according to justice, the plan of redemption could not be brought about only on conditions of repentance. Except it were on these conditions, mercy could not take effect, except it should destroy the work of justice. So that's what I've been talking about. What I get from that is that if we brought a situation upon ourselves, it's in our hands, we can try to solve that problem. God cannot wash away for us. We have to do something to invite him into our life and come to him, and that is a repentance. So speaking of that, so we, we say a lot, this is in 2 Nephi 25, 23, that we are saved by grace after all we can do. And we quote that a lot. But it's kind of confusing because we don't really know what all we can do means. And some people put so much pressure on themselves like, well, have I done all I can do? I guess I need to do more. I need to do more. I need to keep working harder before I can have a grace in my life. And that's not what I get out of it. One day I found this gem that, that correlates to that scripture in Alma 24, 11. And behold, my brethren, since it has been all that we could do to repent of our sins and the many murders which we have committed to get God to take them away from our hearts, it was all we could do to repent sufficiently before God that he would take away our stain. The Holy Ghost just touches my heart and says, all we can do is repent because really we're powerless. I mean, can you really bring about miracles and change in your life without the hand of God? No. <laughs> what he wants from us is just to repent and then invite that mercy in. And it's as simple as that. We need to have that softened heart where we submit to the Lord, where we repent, where we exercise faith and humility. That's all we can do. All we can do is repent. And then he will give us further instructions, further light and knowledge, and we follow that. Okay, I'm going back to Alma 42 again. Okay, I also gave a link for the mediator video. I really love that video because it shows how the atonement works, how mediation works, where we have a debt to God and the debt needs to be paid. So he can't just wash that debt away. It needs to be paid. So that's why a third party comes in. This is why it's so essential that we have God the Father and Jesus Christ. They are two separate people because God the Father is our creditor. We, we owe him a debt if we want to come back into his presence. And he can't wash that away because that would destroy justice. But a third party mediator can come in and the third party can say, okay, I will pay this debt. I will satisfy your demands. And then he turns to us and says, now that I'm willing to satisfy those demands, you are now under my contract. Are you willing to sign a new contract with me? So instead of the contract that says, I will pay for all of my sins and make myself holy so I can get back to God, which I can't do, I sign a new contract and says, okay, he's going to pay for my sins. I am going to repent and submit my will to him. And I guess that's what this all comes down to is that we have the will, we drive our own lives, but we can submit to the Lord. And then our life will just be better than ever. Second Nephi 2 was part of the reading, but I'm not quoting it a whole lot. Okay, I will quote some verses at the beginning. 
it just talks about how the law works. So this whole concept that there is a law and the law has a punishment and there is justice affixed to that. So it just gets you, you know, thinking in, in those legal terms. So here's 2 Nephi 2, and then we'll go back to the talk and finish up. Verses 5 through 8. Men are instructed sufficiently that they know good from evil, and the law is given unto them. And by the law no flesh is justified, because it demands a ransom, a payment. By the law men are cut off. Yea, by the temporal law they were cut off, and also by the spiritual law they perish from that which is good, and they become miserable forever. This is what we this is what life would be like if there was no atonement we would just be perishing and miserable because this law is not our friend wherefore redemption cometh in and through the holy messiah for he is full of grace and truth that's a great verse to memorize look how short that is you could just be like second nephi 2 6 redemption cometh through the holy messiah for he is full of grace and truth and you can whip that out whenever you're feeling down or whenever you need to talk to Satan and get him to go away. Redemption cometh through the Holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. You know, and you tell him. <laughs> Behold, he offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. So that's what it takes. A broken heart and a contrite spirit also known as repentance and submission to his will. Wherefore, how great the importance to make these things known unto the inhabitants of the earth, that they may know that there is no flesh that can dwell in the presence of God, save it be through the merits, the mercy, and the grace of the Holy Messiah, who layeth down his life according to the flesh, and taketh it again by the power of the Spirit, that he may bring to pass the resurrection of the dead, being the first that should arise." I love that passage. I love the language of the scriptures. And that's why it's so amazing and powerful to read the Book of Mormon. Because I could say that in my language, which I have been doing for the past 20 minutes. <laughs> and did you feel a, a great spiritual witness in the last 20 minutes compared to the way that reading the scriptures makes you feel? Isn't that amazing? Because as soon as I say it, instead of, as soon as I read it directly from the scriptures rather than summing it up in my language, that's when the Holy Ghost rushes in and bears witness that this is true. That the atonement is the greatest gift and the greatest um, message that we could proclaim to anybody because we are utterly lost without that Savior. And we just need, we need the Savior to make our lives better than miserable. <laughs> okay, let's finish up with this talk. He talks about moral relativism. A God who makes no demands is the functional equivalent of a God who does not exist. A world without God, the living God who establishes moral laws to govern and perfect his children, is also a world without ultimate truth or justice. It is a world where moral relativism reigns supreme. So here he's explaining why we need to have laws. There needs to be a certain expectation, a certain way to go. You know, just like the prophet says, there's a law. If we obey the law, we get a blessing. It, it creates order. It creates expectations. You know how things are going to go. And it's true across the board. That's what a law is. A law is something that's true across the board. So a God without law, he says that's the functional equivalent of a God that doesn't exist. What's the point of being a leader if there's no rules, if, if there's no foundation set and an expectation set? Then you don't need that. Then you don't have a leader because it's a free-for-all. <laughs> Okay, at the bottom of page four, in matters both temporal and spiritual, the opportunity to assume personal responsibility is a God-given gift, without which we cannot realize our full potential as daughters and sons of God. Personal responsibility for all areas of our life. If I am struggling in a relationship, it's my job to do the work, to understand each other, and to forgive that person, to heal that relationship. And a lot of times that includes changing our thought patterns. And we'll have a lesson on that, I'm sure, because I love that topic. Uh, if I have any other problem, a health problem, financial problem, or whatever, uh, it's our responsibility to find out what we're doing wrong and to change the patterns that are keeping, even if we didn't create that pattern in the first place, change the patterns that are keeping that, keeping that problem in play in our lives. Because as soon as we remove the cause, then things can allow 
themselves. Things can be allowed to shift and to change. And, and, you know, we can manifest new changes and different things in our life. Because we use our agency and our power and obeying the laws to change the outcome there. It is God's will that we be free men and women and able to rise to our full potential, both temporally and spiritually. That we be free from the humiliating limitations of poverty and the bondage of sin. That we enjoy self-respect and independence. That we be prepared in all things to join him in his celestial kingdom. I am under no illusion that this can be achieved by our own efforts alone without his very substantial and constant help. We do not need to achieve some minimum level of capacity or goodness before God will help. Divine aid can be ours every hour of every day, no matter where we are in the path of obedience. But I know that beyond desiring his help, we must exert ourselves, repent, and choose God for him to be able to act in our lives consistently with justice and moral agency. My plea is simply to take responsibility and go to work so that there is something for God to help us with. So I love that balance. Here we're talking about the balance between justice and mercy for salvation, but we're applying it to our daily lives now. There's, an, there's a balance between our efforts and our responsibility and receiving the Lord to bless our lives. Elder Uchtdorf put it best. This was a few years ago. I'll have to look up if you want to find this talk. Um, he said this at a women's conference because I remember sitting there. It was probably 2013 or 14. He said, God is trying to shower down blessings upon our heads, but we're putting up an umbrella. Okay? So once again, God cannot force us to be blessed. We hold the cards for our own lives, and we might be holding up an umbrella. We have certain blocks to receiving those blessings. And I don't think it's like, I don't, I don't like blessings. I don't want blessings. No, it's much more subtle. It's subconscious. Sometimes we have doubts that we're worthy of blessings or we have fears about changes taking place in our lives or we want to control and we're having trouble with submitting. There's pride. There's, there's all sorts of subconscious blocks that could be in the way. But as soon as we identify what that umbrella is and we say, I'm willing to let this go. And, you know, so I work with people and do visualizations and affirmations and we use tools to change our thought patterns to create new positive changes that can basically trade in that umbrella for a big jug of water, okay? Now I'm ready, let me receive those blessings. So that's on our part and we can learn those tools that can help bring that into our life. So that was, that was an awesome talk by Elder Uchtdorf. Let me know if I need to get the link to that. Okay guys, if you really want a certain blessing, then find out what the laws are that govern the blessing and then work at, at becoming obedient to those laws. We are in charge of our own lives. That is the big answer to the question I started with. We are free to act for ourselves and we can take responsibility for the way our life is turning out. It's all in our hands. If we're not happy, we have nobody to blame but ourselves. And we have been given the tools and the opportunities to create more happiness in our lives. And part of that is inviting the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ to bless our lives. So I bear my testimony of that. Thanks for being here with us, guys. By the way, if anybody wants to jump in and teach a lesson, it doesn't have to be this long. It could be five or 10 minutes. Your favorite Ensign article, your favorite scripture. Um, talk to me and you can take a day and you can, you can post your own video and take a turn giving a lesson. I think that'd be great. We can get some variety here. Okay, talk to you guys later. Goodbye.